And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way across the pond with a, with a rare case of Noble Darkness. Not something you see all that often, like known as Legacy of the Soul Flame. A, a man who a man who probably who probably curses and vulnerability saves just as it just as anybody else on the table. The one and only Kevin Pimblett. How you doing today, man? Hey, Mildred. Good to hear you, man. Yeah, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. I had I had come I had come across your site so and the amount of um the. And a fair amount of Warhammer content on that, so I had to get at least one gag in there. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> um, so, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Now, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I guess I remember when I was a young lad. Um, I don't know whether you remember fighting fantasy books with I Steve do. Jackson and Ian Livingston back in the day. Those are the guys who set up Games Workshop ultimately. Mm -hmm. But I remember as a very young lad having a few of those books, uh, the early ones, The Warlock of Firetop Mountain, that sits in my mind, at the back of my mind, actually. Yep. And I remember playing those ones and The Forest of Doom and... The game books evolved a little bit after that, of course, and they came up with their own setting, their own campaigns, their own adventures, and myself and a couple of mates, we, we got into it as, at, at a young age. Mm -hmm. I guess that then cascaded, um, so we started playing around with Warhammer, we started playing with 40k as well, we eventually discovered uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Well, it wasn't eventually, it was fairly rapidly, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. And I remember getting the AD&D second edition uh, Dungeon Master's book, and one of my other friends got the Player's Handbook, and we got together quite frequently. And it was really good, because we combined our resources and we started playing around, and our other friends joined in, and it snowballed. It really got really cool. Of course, back mm -hmm. then, all we were interested in was a bit of hack and slash in the dungeon, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. But eventually, we started seeing other campaign settings, whether it was... I don't know, um, Forgotten Realms, or whether it was Dark Sun, or one of the other settings, and we started getting involved with them, and we messed around with that, and of course we grew up, and we experimented with other games, and eventually we went to university, and went our separate ways, we had uh, different games then, and different people, and we all got involved, and then when we got back together over the summer months, yeah, we, we still played and mm -hmm. uh, we, we still keep in contact to this day. So, yeah, I, I guess it was sort of a slow beginning from kind of fighting fantasy right through to Games Workshop and then Warhammer and then TSR, as it was back in the day, and right through to present day Wizards of the Coast. Mm -hmm. So full gamut, really, of different games and different ways of doing things really enjoyable and it sort of stuck with me i think it's been part of my life for as long as i can remember in some ways to be honest with you so it's just always been there yep and since since you brought up both warhammer and for, and 40k i um i would be remiss if i didn't ask the following um what was during during those games what was your preferred army of choice do you mean back then or nowadays? Um, <laughs> let's go. Let's go with back then and then and then nowadays. So I, I guess back then. Look, I, I'm going to put my hand up here and say, look, uh, I, I had a few ultramarines. Um, I, I did. So help no me. No judgment and, here. <laughs> and in in fantasy, I I had a bunch of goblins and dark elves and. I think what we were really using those miniatures for when we first got hold of them was actually role-playing. There was a bunch of tile sets, as I remember it, uh, basically cardboard that 
you cut up into different shapes, into corridors. There was rooms as well. I think it was called Dungeon Layouts, if memory serves. Mm -hmm. And we, we used those miniatures on the little square, one-inch square grids and move them around to represent where everyone was with some of the role playing we were doing so that that was back then nowadays um i'm more into 30k actually at the moment uh so i've been messing around with the alpha legion in 30k over recent years yeah um i will i so in in other, in other words in other words you can make a convincing argument that you are alpharius <laughs> You are. I am. We all are. <laughs> um, somebody, somebody, not too long ago, messed messed around in um, in in Source Filmmaker and did the did the two Spider Men pointing meme, but with two members of the Alpha Legion just going, "You are Alpharius." <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I remember seeing that. It was pretty good. Um, and of course, of course, once that, of course, once that took off, some cos some um. Um, 40k cosplayers did the exact thing. <laughs> Way to go! Yeah, because meme magic is real. <laughs> but <laughs> I um, I'm pr I'm I'm most I'm most certainly not the not the the, the last per the last person in the room to talk when it comes to um when it comes to their, when it comes to their choice in ar in armies because. Um, throughout throughout war, throughout um, Warhammer, I I had I had done a I had done a lot with um with high with high elves, um, and when it came when it came to when it came to forty k, I I I utilized a I utilized one of those multi faction approaches. It was a good amount of a good amount of IG mainly vehicles and a good amount of salamanders. And Usakar yeah. Creed, just because I'm a dick. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that could be a really good army. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I didn't. Ha I didn't have any. I didn't. I didn't have any titans. But what I did. But what I did have were, th were um, were very spe were very specialized tanks, including the um, Terminus Land Raider, which I which I would <laughs> which I would use for the specific reason uh, for the specific purpose of fucking up people's armors. Yeah, that's the way you're gonna go. I mean, if you want to be all out, uh, we go for broke, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. And yeah, there's the risk of overheating, but in order for that to happen, I'd have to have the I'd have to be the most unlucky man <laughs> on the face of the earth because it's I think it's I think the chance is one in twelve hundred. And the question is, has it ever happened to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> that's a relief. <laughs> um. I did run a demon army once, and that was just an excuse to bring out the living meme that is Doom Rider. Oh, way to go! <laughs> um, I, I any time that I've ever built armies, I have never had the in, I've never had the desire of building armies seriously. My intention has always been to do the dumbest shit possible. So you sound like a wannabe orc player. <laughs> I've I've done I've done I've done orcs. I've um I've jo I've joking I um I have mo I have multiple times had a running gag of, of of saying that orcs are an accurate representation of Arsenal fans. Oh, look! I, I'm not going to pass any comment on this at this stage, Mildred. <laughs> <laughs> I I would I would um. I would, bas I would basically say, I would basically say that I have to I have to wonder if they if they just mo they just modeled orcs after whatever football fans happen happen to be in the bar that night. Um, I I think that's probably how it happened actually because if you look at some of the earlier orc products they're very much uh, hooligan sort of related aren't they? Yeah. Plus the looking b looking back at um at the first couple editions of fa of fantasy and the early editions of um. 40k when it was known as Rogue Trader, because the it's because obviously it's important to note that the the um, 40k from from third edition onwards is the one we're all familiar with. The first two editions, nobody had nobody really had a clue about what they were trying to do. They just it much like a lot of stuff. They just slapped a bunch of things together. It was a really good mashup. I've still got a copy of Rogue Trader sat on the shelf, and mm. I flick back at it once in a while and think, yeah, we, we used to have fun times with Rogue Trader. Um, it wasn't balanced in any particular good way, oh, but God, uh, no. it was still fun. Still very much yeah. fun. Now, 
that br that brings me to legacy to legacy of the soul flame now one th one thing that one thing that really one thing that stood out to me with the, with the in, with the initial pitch of it is you describe it as a noble dark um, campaign setting. Um, now, I ha now when I think of that, I end up thinking of the of the Grim Noble alignment chart. But what does noble dark entail? Right, so I mean, this is a good segue from Warhammer, which of course has the tagline of uh, Grim Dark in mm -hmm. the far distant future. In the Grim Dark, there's only war, right? Mm -hmm. So, I think you could imagine two axes, of course, just as you've described: dark to bright and grim to noble. Yep. So, for me, um, I think noble dark is one in which the current conditions are probably not that good, um, but you've got reason to hope that there can be optimism because an individual or a group of people or maybe even a mass of people have the opportunity to change the future. They can change the status quo and change the direction of where everything's going and they can alter the world mm -hmm. if they're able to. So fundamentally, I think that's where I'm coming from with Noble Dark. And I think the, the analogy that many people use is that Noble Dark is sort of like Lord of the Rings, maybe. Um, you know things are pretty bad, there's bad stuff going down, but also there's there's opportunity to make things good. You, you can go and destroy that ring, you can mm -hmm. forge your way to Mount Doom and go ahead and try to get into Mordor and try to get rid of that ring and destroy it forever. So there is hope, there is definitely hope. Um, so that's my take on it for Noble Dark, and I think in this particular campaign setting, the sort of dark aspect is that undead have won. There's been an undead apocalypse. Mm -hmm. The dead are everywhere. They're, they're under your feet right now. They're slumbering, most of them, but uh, there are these really powerful undead rulers that are really active, that are clashing with other undead rulers. And some of them, yeah, look, they, they like to feast on humans, who are the major race of the setting. And in fact, mm -hmm. the only player character race for the setting. Now, some of the undead, yeah, they they want to feast, they they want to destroy the humans, um, but some of them, say the vampires, that they're actually all right with humans because they they need blood to survive. So they they don't want to destroy the humans, but mm -hmm. they want to, shall we say, farm or harvest them. It would be a better word. So different undead in this setting have different attitudes towards human beings. Some want to just finish them all off, get on with the job. Others, yeah, they, they want to cultivate humans for their own nefarious reasons. Mm -hmm. So Noble Dark in this context then, yeah, the, the undead have won, but there's reason for optimism because there's opportunity to destroy the undead rulers. They can be deposed, they can be got rid of, they can be eliminated. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, when you do that, another one just takes over their territory. So you've got to think, how are you going to get rid of one if another one's just going to step in their place? Maybe you need to take out several at the same time. And that's the inherent challenge alongside trying to organize human beings. Because in this setting, humans are still very much humans with all the glorious flaws and abilities that they would otherwise have, along with some magical abilities. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. But before we, before we get into that, and I probably should have asked this first, but um, I've never been accused of having a professional podcast. Um, what pro what prompted the idea for for this pro for this project as a whole? Was this a campaign setting that you had be that you had been tooling around with at your own table for a while, or did it have a different point of origin? Yeah, great question. So this is a personal campaign setting. It started out maybe uh, twenty odd years ago, something like that. Um, yeah, give or take. So mm -hmm. I've played it with quite a number of my different groups over the years, and it's evolved um, over that time. We started out using D&D &D for the rule set for this particular campaign setting, but we were making so many adjustments to it, so many tweaks, so many house rules, didn't quite seem to fit. So we were all sort of hunting for the right 
campaign, sorry, the right system to run it with. And one way we went was to just have completely freeform, systemless, and that sort of worked. But every once in a while, we decided we needed some kind of check or some kind of dice to roll to try to figure out whether things worked. And so we, we decided we did need a system, but it wasn't D&D. &D, and we were sort of hunting around a little bit. So that's why we decided to generate a brand new system to take care of all the oddities and all the peculiarities that this particular setting has. Mm -hmm. Now, what I find what I find in, what I find interesting about that is you is in that in that kind of in that kind of setup. Um, I'm reminded of something that I've said about about D and D for for a while, and I did and I covered it in amusing about a about a year ago. Is that D and D has um, certain baggage that some of its biggest adherents don't seem to want to admit, because there, there's a, um, there's, a, there's been an attitude for the longest time that you could use D and D to run any kind, any kind of fantasy, and that's not really true. I, I think you know you, you certainly can use D and D for quite a smorgasbord of different campaigns there's, mm. there's no two ways about that but it might not be shall we say ideal or optimized or the, the best one possible for particular settings yeah. and i mean for, for legacy of the soul flame it's just a personal opinion mm -hmm. that we found D, &D to well, it, it worked after a fashion, but we, we decided, do you know what? We, we, were running, um, we were running bloodlines and lineages per class. So, for instance, rogues had to have a certain surname, and we, we'll talk about this in a little while. But it, it still didn't gel until we decided, right, what we're going to do is have the bloodlines according to their magical abilities, which is the way we always wanted it anyway. So there's no particular class in this system. You're all humans, and you can all write a little background, and you can tell us you know, whether you're really good at lockpicking or not. And if you are, that's great. And if you're not, no worries whatsoever. And from there, it sort of cascaded to this idea, well, we, we can have those genealogies, those bloodlines. So who was your mum and who was your dad? Mm -hmm. And... We can figure out what your magical abilities are from there. And so, yeah, you, you could probably squeeze D&D &D into that space. Um, so if you look at, for instance, Dark Sun, which has wild talents for psionic abilities, you could imagine something similar being done for these magical abilities here. And it, it would fit. And that's one of the ways we originally tried to play this. Yeah. Um, so it's it's not impossible, but for us, yeah, we, we just wanted that something new to develop, and it probably wasn't quite um, storytelling, freeform, systemless. We did want to roll a few die once in a while, mm. and it's just the way it developed. So over 20-odd years, here we are now with a newly formed system which seems to fit the premise of the game and you know we, we don't even have hit points here or health points it is all associated with your condition so mm -hmm. have you been knocked out have you got scars from the battle because the other thing we wanted to do here is um as we grew older we sort of thought about it a little bit more and we wanted to discourage uh perhaps the excessive violence that was present in some of the games obviously um and to do that, we decided there's going to be consequences if you get in a fight. You know, if, if you get hurt in a fight, you're going to have some downtime. You, you're going to have injuries. And we wanted to make sure that was present so that role-playing was actually encouraged as a way to think through problems without drawing swords at the first opportunity, which is perhaps what people do, I guess, when they're dungeoneering in their youth. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing wrong with hack and slash, of course. Many people enjoy that, myself included. But I think we wanted something a bit more mature. Uh, I hope your listeners uh, get the point on that one. Yeah. So it's um, it's a little bit different from D&D. &D. Yeah. Now, some... Now, um... I could I could make a joke that you probably had a tw you probably had a twenty page document of um ho of house rules just like just like I did several times but I'm but I'm getting ahead of myself now I, I don't I don't think it would be a joke <laughs> well as the old saying goes truth is the greatest comedy oh that is for sure but 
Now, one thing of one thing I'm curious about on on this is the fact that um, now, unless I'm mistaken, you move you move you ended up opting for a d6 pool mechanic. Now, this now I have now there's two questions I have I have on I have on that first. I would like you to go. I would like you to go into the core of the, the core of the system because obviously me saying D6 based doesn't tell a whole lot. But what? But the other question is what led you to pick to picking a D6 based approach? All right. So there's a couple of questions there. So the D6 based approach is simply because D6s are the most common die that people have. So mm -hmm. if this is your first role playing game and it probably isn't, I, I would suspect, for most of the people who are going to get this. But if it is, then you know what? People have things like snakes and ladders, board games in their house. They they have D6s associated with that, so they can go and grab those D6s. So that was the motivating factor for people who are new to role-playing games, new to rolling die. I think we wanted something to be accessible, and so to be accessible, that necessitates D6s, because as much as we all love those D20s, um, they are comparatively rarer in people's possessions than D6s, and I, I think that's just a statement that I'm, I'm going to let stand on its mm -hmm. own. I think then the, the other component is we could do this totally systemless, right? We, we could say we don't need a system at all. We're just going to do pure role playing. And if we like it, we'll just let it stand. And if there's a negotiation to be had, if we want to think about our lock picking ability, then why don't you persuade the GM that you're really good at lock picking or you've got something in your background that's relevant. Otherwise, you're, you're just going to be fumbling about with that lock. And maybe you could describe that as part of that role playing session. Mm -hmm. So one of the first rules that we thought about is don't roll any die uh, unless you have to, right? So mm -hmm. so the system then is, yeah, it, it is D6, but do you know what? If you want to opt for a more heavy storytelling or narrative approach, go right ahead. Do you know what? As if I could stop anybody doing that anyway. And I, I think that's part of the beauty of it as well. Yeah. So we, we've got that core rule if something feels right in the narrative or in the storytelling, just go right ahead. You don't need to roll any dice and we can't force you. So mm -hmm. be our guest, be our guest, absolutely. So then let's talk about the core mechanics then. With all that said, so if you do want to roll dice and you're not really totally focused on that uh, storytelling approach, then we're, we're going to use some D6s. So for, I, I guess there's sort of, two or three different components here. The first one is kind of a skills test or a resolution. Second component would be combat. And then the third component would be magic, although they're all sort of interrelated. Mm -hmm. And the magic system is pretty similar to the other two. So for the skills, um, we get players to define how good they are at various things so we could say right well have you ever picked any locks before let's let's go back to that rogue example mm -hmm. so maybe maybe our rogue friends you know they're they're pretty skilled they've they've acted as a lock picker professionally before so we say all right you, you can have a three plus to pick any lock you like on a d6 that's fine other people, well, do you know what? They, they might have seen it done before. They, they know it's plausible, so they might get a 6+, plus or 5+, plus to try to do the same thing. So they might just get lucky just by fiddling around, and that's what was represented on that 6+. plus. So we've, we've got that sort of background built in, and of course this system then encourages our players to think about their characters' backgrounds in a bit more depth than perhaps they would do otherwise, and I think that's all for the best. So, taking that lockpick again. So let's say he or she is a really decent lockpick, so they're going to get a 3 plus to try and open a door or whatever it happens to be. We now need to think about how tough that door is to open, and that's represented by the pool. So if it's a fairly regular or routine lock that our lockpicking friend wants to get open, then we'll just put one dice in the pool, and so you need a 3 plus on one dice. Mm -hmm. If it's a little bit more of a pressured situation, so maybe there's a combat swirling around and they're trying to open this door that's behind them and they've got to get through the door, otherwise the hordes of undead are going to kill them. 
then yeah, there's time pressure. They're, they're sweating a little bit, and uh, the hands are just oh, they're a bit slick, and they can't get hold of the lock picking tools, and they're trying as hard as they can, and they're hearing screams behind them. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're going to have two dice in that uh, dice pool. So they need a three plus on each of those d6s to open that door. Now, it goes up, so you you could have really elaborate locks, you could have amazing magical lock devices, and you can add loads of dice to this pool. Yeah. Now, within this within this kind within this kind of system, some there are um sometimes there are sometimes there have been there have been d6 and other systems that utilize some sort of extra effect depending on the depending on the kind of die that's rolled um when it where it whether it be the whether it be the oh, the approach of glitches in say shadow runs um massive pool of d6s or the wild die that's used in game that's used in the um d6 system from west end games the thing that powered um the star their um star wars rpg for instance um do you ha- do you have anything akin to that if if somebody were to roll a natural a natural six or sixes or a natural one? So if there's a natural one, it's just a failure. If it's a natural six, it's an auto success. I think one of the main features here that we want to that we've implemented is the collaboration rule, and I think this is it's not perhaps new, but formalized here. We we've really enjoyed playing it. So the collaborative system is, let's go back to that example of the lockpick trying to open the door whilst there's a big fight going on. One of the other members of the party, well, they're not any good at fighting. So they decide to help the lockpick out. You know, the the lockpick says, right, pass me the... Pass me the rod that's uh, five inches long that looks like it's got a pointy end and might be used by a dentist. And they go, all right, here it is, here it is. So they're quickly helping him out as much as possible. So our lockpick gets a plus one bonus on either dice, and that lockpick can choose which one they want to have the plus one on, and they can do that uh, at any point. They can do that before or after they've rolled. Usually we play after it's rolled because it just makes more sense. Although for dramatic tension, sometimes we say before it's rolled. Um, So they get a bonus. Now, what's in it for the person that's helping out? Well, we don't have experience points or leveling up in this particular system. Instead, it's a little bit more like real life. Mm. So the more you practice at things, the better you get. So the person who's collaborating, who's helping out our lockpicking friend, suddenly starts connecting the dots in their head and goes, ah, well, um, I had to use that five-inch rod that looks like a dentist's tool. So I know that that tool could really help out with picking a lock should I never need to do it. So at the end of the session, that collaborator might move their lock picking ability from a six plus, he knows it's possible, to a five plus. Mm-hmm. Seen it done. His friend has helped out. And uh, yeah, in a pinch, he could try and replicate what he's seen the professional lock pick do. All right, I, I, can, I can certainly get that. And um, to, to kind of capstone the core, the core mechanic discussion, um, a lot, a lot of games, especially games outside outside of the outside of the big entries, tend to have what I've nicknamed a extra effort mechanic. Sometimes it takes the form of extra effort. Sometimes it takes the form of an edit button. But there's some kind of pool in that regard. Um, I already mentioned Shadowrun. The ex- the example that that has is um, is Edge. Um, Savage Worlds has Bent has Bennies. Um, World of Darkness has Willpower. Um, War- Warhammer Fantasy and the um, FFG 40k games have fortune. Um, does Legacy of the Soul Flame have something in has something in that particular motif? So not quite in the same form as you've just illustrated with those other games. What we have instead is something called a Soul Flare. Now a Soul Flare is part of the magic system and a soul flare is something that all humans can do they stoke the fires of the soul flame Mm -hmm. and they get super powered for a very short amount of time no more than about 
five or ten minutes and a few combat rounds, depending on the precise nature of what's going on and their character. During that time, though, they get all sorts of crazy bonuses that they can use in-game, particularly with regard to magic. Um, so they're able to cast more spells, they're able to cast them a lot easier, even in pressured situations. They just happen, they go off. So they can basically bypass the rules for a very short amount of time in-game, and they just say, right, I, I'm undergoing a soul flare. That's it. I'm, I'm done with this situation. I'm just going for it, and I'm going to bypass all these extra rules that we don't really care about. There are consequences to that. They suddenly become uh, four times as attractive to undead as they previously were. We, uh, and in the game, there's loads of undead. Uh, we have this thing called the rule of the dozen. If there are 12 or less people in a place at any one time, they're usually safe. But more than that, you start attracting undead. It's a bit like moths to a flame. So one character who's undergoing a soul flare counts as four characters. For the period of the soul flare mm -hmm. um so it's dangerous and then afterwards as well they they suffer burnout effects so they probably are going to go temporarily blind they're going to be real hungry they you know that burns a lot of calories mm -hmm. so they, they need a good feed and they also need to sit down they, they need to rest a little while further you know maybe get their feet up for half an hour just to recover from this excess effort so it's not quite the same mechanic or the same idea as Edge and other things, but it's a way to get around some of the rules, not all of the rules, but some of the rules for a short amount of time and get some bonuses. All right. And since since that since that was since that was given what was brought up um, previously, <clears throat> you mentioned um you meant you mentioned blood you mentioned bloodlines in the bit and i think i think this would be as good a time as any to get to get into that so with character creation you you stated earlier about this being a cla a classless approach now typically in a in a lot of games that do that do a that do a classless setup it's usually revolved around get around allocating a a um, set of points um, some t sometimes they have some sort of an archetype that provides a starting framework. Sometimes they sometimes they just put you in the deep end, say swim. Damn it! Um, where on that spectrum would you say Soul Flame is? Um, probably somewhere between. Uh, so I think it's probably better to just illustrate what we do with character creation. Mm -hmm. the, there's a couple of choices to be made. So the first one is who were your parents? Who's your mother and who's your father, genetically? So you might not know your parents. You might be an orphan or something else, but you will inherit certain things from those parents. So the first thing that you inherit is your magic. So one of your parents gives you your dominant magic ability plus their own recessive. And then the other parent gives you either a different recessive ability, which is to say low-level ability, so when I say recessive, I just mean low level. Dominant ability is kind of mid-tier. Now, if both of your parents had the same surname, maybe they were both called Smith, just to give a real-world analogy, mm -hmm. then you would get what's called an enhanced ability, which is like an upper-tier magical ability for that particular surname. So there are lots of different magical abilities. So I, I, I'll, I'll talk about one, perhaps. So the updrift family are noted for electrostatics and throwing lightning bolts. Their recessive ability is generating a charge. And you can absolutely be a jerk with this one. You can shake mm -hmm. people's hands and give them a jolt if you really wanted to. Um, you can do that in combat offensively as well. You can try to give them a good jolt uh, if you touch them. So that, that's the recessive level ability. The dominant level ability, you can literally low throw lightning bolts. So you just reach out with your hand and go whack, there's a lightning bolt, slam it into your opponent. The higher tier ability, the enhanced ability, you can charge the air around you so you get a uh, area of effect, a radius, uh, with your electrostatics, you charge the very air around you and you just go bam, 
that's basically the same as electromagnetic pulse. So you can take out some electronics when you're doing that as well. Um, and it affects all opponents within a certain radius of the caster. Mm -hmm. So the different tiers, they, they tell us what the character can do. Um, some people like to choose just one uh, ability set. So those electrostatics ones that I've just gone through. So that's one uh, family. Other people like to mix and match a bit more, so they might go for the lightning bolt and the uh, jolt by touch, and then they choose something from a different family altogether. So they might have, um, I don't know, the, a basic telekinetic ability, so they can throw some levers over the other side of the room or levitate a gold coin that sat on a table opposite them. So they, mixing and matching like that is probably the most common way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Now... With, now, with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, cla a lot of cl I've in my experience, a lot of classless systems can can, can um, have a reputation of being a bit intimidating for the, for those less experienced. Um, the it, the insanity of some of some universal systems is the is probably the poster boy for this kind of thing. Um, and of course, of course, when I mention that, I'm the big one that I'm thinking of is stuff like is stuff like Hero System, where it takes where it has 600 pages of just character yeah. creation. Don't get me wrong, I love Hero System, but uh, but it is what it is. Um, for sure, is the is the concept of choice paralysis when it comes to character creation something that you you guys have taken into consideration? Yeah, I. It it, it's a it's a hard balance to strike because we wanted to provide enough family surnames so people actually had choice mm -hmm. um, but not too much that we get that paralysis that you speak about which certainly is an issue i think the best way of sort of thinking about this is for a person to come along and say you know what's my favorite superhero maybe do, do i want to be someone like spider-man and swing some webs all over the place in which mm -hmm. case you know we've got a surname that can enable you to be a little bit more like spider-man or you could think of your favorite x-man instead um do you do you want to be a little bit like uh i, I don't know um well you can pick your favorite x-man uh, maybe maybe wolverine or something i, I don't know do you want to grow get out of my long... head do you want to grow long, <laughs> long claws at will? In which case, there's a surname for that as well. So we've got a lot of different powers, and I think the best way I could tell people to approach this is just to think of your favorite X-Man or your favorite superhero. It's not going to be Superman. It's not going to be someone who has all the powers in the world, right? Um, it's going to be a limited rota. But think about the sort of X-Man that you would like to be. Mm -hmm. And there's probably something in the book that would cater to that. And I'm ge I'm guessing that it, that within the book you're planning on putting in a few pregens to kind of show how this kind of thing works. Yeah, we. The, I've got a um, an extension to the Kickstarter to have a, uh, a character sheet done up if we sit, hit a certain level, and if that happens, I'll certainly do that, and we'll have a couple of uh, pre-generated characters as part of that release as well. I think we're about. I haven't looked uh, in the past few hours, but I think we're about £100 away from that at the moment, mm -hmm. so hopefully we'll be able to pass that mark and I'll get that done uh, yeah. in the near future. Now, when it, com now um, when it comes to... Um, when it comes to combat, you had, met you had mentioned not, not, doing, um, so not doing something like hit points, and one of the things that immediately comes to mind with that, with that kind of approach is twofold. On one hand, the possibility of it being more of a um, more of a more of a wound tally like approach, this in the same way that you that you might see in say um, World of Darkness. The other thing that came to mind is is having it be a, is having it be a narrative thing that the player never even never even sees is only is only told through through the uh, GM, such as in Unknown Armies. Um, how similar or different? would would um hit would your equivalent to hit points um be wouldn't be um in soul flame 
Right, so that, that's a very good question. So we have a number of different states that a character can be in. So they, they can be un uninjured, they're, they're absolutely fine. Some hits might just give them a glancing blow, so no real damage. Some of the hits that they receive, they're, they're going to leave a scar, right? They, they might knock your tooth out or something like that. So that, that's one of the options. Mm -hmm. So you, you could be, let's call those those category of results hurt. So you, you, you're going to live, but do you know what? For a little while, it's just going to be painful. Um, that's what the hurt condition is. You can be knocked to the ground, so you can be made prone, and that is presumably going to hurt as well you might some of that might be tripping so you could get tripped up but some of it you could be smashed over the head with a mace or whatever it happens to be mm -hmm. the next step up from that is incapacitated so you've suffered some kind of knockout blow and that may or may not have lasting effects on you and then step up from that well death really um but there is for the pcs a special rule that we've implemented which we refer to as on death's door and that is if it happens in combat and the dice show that you you should be dead then we're not going to put you at death just right now we're just going to say on death's door which means you need immediate medical aid mm -hmm. if you're going to survive and so hopefully another party member will step in and say right we, we need to bandage this guy or someone needs to distract that undead away uh, taunt that undead away from the body so we can get to it so that needs to happen otherwise death will come in so mm -hmm. the, there can be lasting effects to having combat which is something that we wanted to have um you know, those scars can stay around. Uh, but from a role-playing point of view, we, we wanted to have a system which which had a little bit of crunch, but also a system that encouraged role-playing and emphasized the dangerous nature of combat along the way. And indeed, in some instances, combat is going to be inevitable. You, there are the undead out there, and they are hungry for those human beings. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, when dealing with other humans, your first reaction probably shouldn't be to draw that axe and threaten them. It should be to try and have a little bit of a negotiation and have a chat, see if you can bring them on side without a threat of violence. And when it now, when it comes to when it come, when it come, ah, one of the one of the other things that you hit that you hinted at was the was the presence of magic in within this setting and i've i've jo i've joked that we i've joked that in that um that we seem we seem to be in it we seem to be in a bit of an age where every where everybody is um putting in their own their own magic system one person might blame sanderson i'm not sure if i'd go that far but it, it but it is a th it is a thing and that brings and um you have and you have a more birthright like approach when it comes to soul flame i'd like you to delve into that right so the system for magic is pretty much the same as it is for the skills testing and the combat so we have a skill level that the player characters have to cast their spells we, we assume it's a four plus most of the time unless they've been tutored as a youngster in which case they may get three plus you know they're well practiced and so on so most player characters would be a four plus or three plus for magic once in a while there might be a five plus person who doesn't really like using their magical abilities because it feels like they might attract the undead and they're a bit scared so we could use that as a role-playing opportunity but most pcs would have three plus or four plus mm -hmm. now depending on the level of magic that they're using whether it's that recessive dominant or enhanced level there's different numbers of dice in the pool so if you're trying to do a recessive ability which is very minor you're building up that electrostatic charge because you just want to be a jerk next time you shake that guy's hand then yeah three plus on one dice and to be quite honest if it's not a pressured situation i think most gms would just say yep yeah, that's fine no need to roll you build up that charge it's absolutely fine mm -hmm. so if you want to throw that lightning bolt though at uh, the dominant level which is the next tier up then you're going to need three plus on both of those two die that are going to go in the pool so two dice for that lightning bolt 
And if you want to blow the air around you and be a sort of in-person electromagnetic pulse, then it's three die, each of which you're going to have to have that three plus in there. So it gets really hard as you go up the tiers for those special effects, for those enhanced magical effects. It's really hard to get them off. Mm -hmm. But that's, again, where the soul flame comes in. Uh, because you can undergo a soul flare, which provides you with that enhancement and says, hey, I, I'm just going to ignore the rules for a little while. And you can get off those recessive abilities automatically. The dominant abilities suddenly drop down to only one dice. So you want to throw a lightning bolt? Be my guest. Three plus on one dice rather than on two. So it makes it much, much easier for these things to go off and for the characters to just start throwing lightning bolts as they will. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that character who was casting the lightning bolt ordinarily could only do this once per day. But during a soul flare, he can do it every single combat round if he so desires. So... Yeah, there's ways of bypassing all of these rules and making these characters faster and so on and so forth. And um, this, uh, this Soul Flare, it's really an integral part of a game, which uh, is probably not seen in other role-playing systems as much. And you'll find if you're in a party, there's always going to be someone in a particular combat situation that wants to undergo a Soul Flare, and people will say, is that a good idea? Do we want extra undead to fight? Is the issues around doing that? You know, you're going to go blind, and you're going to be really hungry afterwards. Are you sure you want to do this? And they go, yeah, we, we need to deal with this right now. We'll worry about the consequences later. Mm -hmm. But those consequences will come. They're inevitable, as sure as day follows night. So... The characters need to think through when they're going to go undergo those soul flares and what the consequences for the party might actually be. Oh. All right, I can I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that. Now, given th given the fact that you that um, I do want uh, there is one thing I want to kind of high kind of highlight when it comes to combat, and that is durability. Now, obvious, obviously, we can't have people being com being completely tanky in this in a setting where you're trying to not draw too much attention. But, ha but um, how, but how, but would it be fair to say that there's a degree of squishiness when it comes to even when it comes to even um starting PCs and even advan even more advanced ones. There is a degree of squishiness. There's always a danger in going into a melee situation. But I think the more advanced characters will have better equipment. Mm -hmm. So the, there's two components for the combat system. Firstly, there's working out whether you've hit something, which again uses a skill level combined with the dice pool. Um, and then there is the damage resolution step. So you might I don't know, have Kevlar armor or something on you, which is probably going to stop a fair amount of bullets and swords getting through. Um, and so what we do for that damage resolution, we have a pool of dice according to your protection level. So if you're wearing uh, Kevlar armor, then you're going to have, from memory, four dice in the pool, and you just look for the lowest. So 4d6, pick the lowest, and that's the result that you apply. So hopefully there's going to be a low score in there, and this usually prevents the death of the character involved, mm -hmm. because a 6 would be indicating death. So you roll those 4d6, chances are you're going to have probably at least one with a 1 or a 2 in there, and you know, you're know you going to get away with it. But I think the problem then comes when there is a flurry of blows uh, that are coming in from a large number of sources. So particularly if the characters are going to take on something like an undead ruler of a territory, they're going to be in a lot of trouble if they don't have some really decent equipment on them. So yeah, they, they can still feel a little bit squishy, even at high level, but that's the risk that the characters take. And mm -hmm. hopefully... The more experienced characters will have a little bit more gold and will be able to purchase some of the better equipment in the game before they start thinking along the lines of, do you know what? We could take out an undead territory ruler. We can change the world forever. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> now, when I was going through the preview image for the table of contents, there was one thing that I, I knew I was, go I was going to have to ask about, and that is Taint and Union. If I'm if I'm reading this correctly, because 
Uh, because it is it is a small image, and I and I don't have the I don't have the ability to enhance images. I'm not a Blade Runner. Yep. Yeah, you read it right. Taint and union. So this is another component of character generation. So unions are collectives of the human beings. So some of the unions are political, some of them are kind of knightly, um, some of them are trading unions. And so they get banned together to, for their own mutual benefit and protection. Some of them are very altruistic and they, they say, right, well, the trade must get through because the people over there in that uh, settlement have to be fed. The, the food has to get through, otherwise they're going to starve. So they make the pledge to the union that the food is going to get through no matter what i i will stake everything and my colleagues will help me out in this and we're going to get that food through to that settlement so people don't starve so that's the idea behind a union it provides a commonality a way of thinking and a way in which humans can organize with the fellow beings to try to overcome some of the deprivations of the undead mm -hmm. taint is something that all humans have in this setting. Taint is the curse, might be a benefit, but the curse that the undead rulers give human beings just for having the audacity of being born in their territory. And some, are, some of them are quite negative, some of them are actually pretty positive. So there's a vampire, for instance, who wants humans to do quite well, because the way the vampire sees it, that's new blood. And you know what? New blood is tasty, and I want humans to succeed. And so go ahead and breed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to kill you when I feed on you. I'm just going to take what I need, and you're going to be fine. I want humans in my territory. So that particular vampire encourages humans, so his taint is actually fairly good in mm -hmm. that regard. Um, there's a bunch of skeleton sort of creatures that we refer to as bone morphs, and they curse the humans born in their lands to have extra bones. So they might have an extra rib, for instance, and some of them might be more significantly mutated than even that. They, they might have an extra appendage. The bonus is for the uh, undead when these people eventually die it just means more bones for them to create more undead out of um and of course that pre presents role-playing opportunities as well so mm -hmm. do, do you hide that little mutation or do you think society is going to be accepting of that and in general the people under the domain of the bone morphs they're, they're pretty accepting people but outside of that yeah look there, there can be a little bit of project prejudice um there are others as well who seek to diminish the human beings, so they limit uh, soul flares, they limit soul flame, so they they can really try to impact the humans because they, they just want to finish the job. They, they want mm -hmm. to kill all humans and be done with it. So there's, there's various different taints out there that human beings have in the game, and all player characters have to choose one. And... When you mentioned when you mentioned mutation when you mentioned um, mutations, um, are is is it a case where where each where each one is each one is specific to each taint each taint or are some of them a bit more randomized? Right. So a few of them are a bit more randomized. So if you're part of the uh, territory of that undead skeletal lord, then yeah, you'll get an extra bone or two. Maybe you'll have lots. Maybe you'll only have a few. Maybe it'll be hidden inside your torso. Maybe you'll have an extra arm. So that can be randomized, or you can have a discussion with your GM, which you'd prefer to role play with, and it's fairly flexible. Mm -hmm. I admit, I will admit I might be a little bit partial to rent to randomize because um because of my because of my time with stuff like Gamma World, where people would come up with absolutely completely completely bonkers um results <laughs> yeah so i uh, absolutely you know if you want to roll the dice and say right I, it might be an extra bone inside my torso or it might be an extra arm or appendage then you, you can go ahead and do so mm -hmm. now when it now some now sometimes whenever whenever something and this is this is probably something that's already been answered, but when it comes to something like taint and a lot of other systems, there, there's um there's often cases where there's the temptation to 
um, go fur go further when it comes to taint, but run the but run the risk of becoming something not as hu as human. Um, is that something that's possible here, or is a or is a taint a, or is taint a one and done within character creation? For most player characters, it's done and dusted at character creation. For some, there are certain taints which represent, shall we say, a temptation to use. So there are some undead which say, hey, borrow my power. Just borrow it. If you're ever in need, it's right there. All you've got to do is call. You can have a little bit of our power. No problem. It's all okay. But of course, there's a price to be paid for that. Mm -hmm. And so it, that can come into the role-playing situation as well. So the, you do get characters who do call upon that power, and as a result, they suffer negatives for the rest of their lives. And um, it, it can be a real opportunity for role-playing, and also it can be really deceptively hard whether to ever call on these powers because everybody would immediately say no i'm never going to use it until that one situation which never has arisen before and you go oh do you know what i i'm tempted uh, but i know the consequences i'm still tempted though because mm -hmm. it's a pretty bad situation so there's some some amount of role playing there as well without yeah. a shadow of a doubt now when it comes to advancement, especially in classless systems, the the most common form of advancement that I, that I've seen is the um, XP as currency approach. You get it, you get XP from role playing, from survi from surviving, from doing something awesome and or stupid, some sometimes both, and and you spend that XP on it on advancements. Um, Somet sometimes it sometimes it's a bit more um a bit more ref a bit more refined sometimes it's sometimes it's open season is soul flame working on a working on a similar paradigm or or is that not the case that's not the case there is no experience point system here there's there's no uh, currency to be spent but advancement happens in the same way as it might in the real world. You advance because you've learned something new, or you've helped someone who was already skilled out. So we we'll go back to that lock picking example. Mm -hmm. You've picked up how to pick a basic lock just by working with your lock picking expert friend along the adventure. So you share those skills out, and at the end of the session, you go, right, well, what have I learned? What has my character actually been through, and what could they apply it to in future situations? So someone might say to the GM, right, well, I've learned a little bit of lockpicking this session. Can I improve my lockpicking skill score? And the answer is going to be yes, absolutely. Go ahead. You, you can change from a 5 plus to a 4 plus. That's, that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. Other people might say, well, do you know what? I, I saw this dude, and he showed me how to activate a cell phone, how to switch it on. There was a certain combination of buttons that I had to press, and it was a passcode, basically. And that character might not know that that passcode was unique to that cell phone, but they'll know now how to operate that cell phone and how to switch it on and maybe some of that basic functionality. So they might go from thinking it's utterly alien to saying, OK, well, do you know what? I, I can see how that might work and I can see how I might be able to do that. So transfer me from thinking it's utterly alien to giving it a six plus go for trying to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So there's all, all sorts of these sort of skills that you could imagine, uh, which the character at the end of the session can say to the GM, right, well, what have I learned? I've learned X, Y, and Z, and I want to advance them. And the GM says, well, okay, uh, you can advance A and B, but C, you're going to need a little bit more training in before you can advance that because you're already really quite skilled at that. So you're not getting a two plus. You're going to have to find someone who's a trainer or similar to, to advance your skill from three to two because that's fairly hard. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, now um, when it comes to when it comes to the over when it comes to the overall book, you've um, I believe you have I believe you have said that you are aiming for four hundred and twenty pages, um, at full at full co at full color, correct? Yep, that's correct. Um, 
Now, I realize this is this is uh, this is obvious, but it is something I I have to ask because of my because of some because of my habits. Um, when it comes to the PDF version, are you are you planning on having that fully um, bookmarked? There will be bookmarks from the table of contents that you can click on, and it goes to the right chapter. So I've already coded that in. It's already been done. Which is in interesting, because hyperlinked bookmarks is still something that I don't see all that often. Yep, I've already hyperlinked it. Uh, that sprang to mind because it's something that I like to use as well. So I can go to the table of contents and say, right, well, what are the rules for taint? Well, mm -hmm. I'll go to that chapter, I'll just click on it, and lo yeah. and behold, it's just done. So mm -hmm. it's that kind of functionality that I like, and I know other people like, so we, we put it in right from the start. All right. Now... You had you had um, now at the time of this recording you had you had you had set the initial goal at two hundred and fifty pounds and you're currently at um, fourteen hundred and change, which I do which I do want to give my congratulations for that. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the digital version at the very least? Because I know that the physical version is going to take a significant amount longer because, well, printing is hell. Right, so we're going to fulfill this Kickstarter with drive through RPG, mm -hmm. and they'll take care of not only the digital side of things, but also the physical printing. So they use Lightning Source, there's uh, one set up in the United States and one in the United Kingdom. So depending where you are in the world, you'll get it posted out from one of those two sites. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the digital one, um, what I need to do is give everything a final read through, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the major other change that I'm going to make is to put our backers' names, who wanted to be named, into the back of the book and as part of the back material. That shouldn't actually take too long. The book is actually written. You know, it's uh, we've got those 420 pages there. I've got the back page ready to go for the backers' names, and that should not take me too long. So I'm. I'm really happy that we can get the digital version out uh, pretty pretty expediently. Mm -hmm. Now, as you say, the printed version is a different matter because what we've got to do is send off for what's called a proof copy. And so the publisher then receives the proof, which is the basically the first time it's ever been printed. And we have to have a look through that because we might spot uh, really odd mistakes or we might spot printing issues that we go back and say right well we need to redesign the pdf here and here to get rid of some of these issues there might be color balance issues that we have to deal with so we'll, we'll go back and we, we could iterate on that a couple of times um, it, it usually comes down to the old adage of why is the first thing that you try going to be the best? It, it, it probably isn't. So that's <laughs> why, that, yeah, that, that, that's why we, we want to have a look at a couple of different proofs just to make sure it's as top quality as it can be. Then any other issues are down to the printer rather than the publisher. Mm -hmm. So your, your question then is how soon? So I would estimate uh, July 2021. All right, I, that's uh, that's a that's a well. You you already mentioned that most of it is most of it is done. It's just the final pass and adding the backers' names. So that's it. That's about the turnaround that I that I would expect given the given the circumstance. And yeah, so I mean, we, with the global pandemic as well, it's worth emphasizing that of course postage is not what it was before the pandemic happened. So the, there might be slowdowns in receiving those proofs. There might be slowdowns in people getting a hold of the actual printed material. But I can put my hand on my heart and say, if there are, then it's not my fault. <laughs> well, I never, I never had, I never had a very, high, I never had a very high opinion of sh of of um. Of time of timely shipping even even before the pandemic so <laughs> <laughs> so I'll... yeah we, we we're really gonna try hard to to stick to that deadline because it's entirely feasible and we just need to make sure those proofs are right we need to get those final names in there and just do that check over as well as we can mm -hmm. and i'll cer i'll certainly be keeping a cl a close eye on how on how it develops as i as i always do but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. 
Oh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me here, Mildred. It's been great to talk with you. Oh, not my pleasure. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, we, we have a few other projects in mind for the future, so hopefully you would be happy to have me back at a future point. Oh, definitely. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>